hello once again welcome welcome it is good to see you today we are discussing cardiac pathology incredibly high yield step one step two whatever medical exam you are taking you're going to need to know this cardiac pathology today we're going to discuss some really i think helpful mnemonics there will be some memes there will be some questions there will be laughs there will be tears we're going to go on this roller coaster together now before we get started please hit subscribe if you've not yet subscribed uh tell your friends if they are looking for a resource to make studying for usmle step one step two ck even step three in the future more accessible better tell them about aaron brown on youtube i can't wait for them to join us too so let's get started here okay great so we're going to start off with some of the congenital issues um that can be congenital that can um develop but uh you know left to right shunts what do we know about left to right shunts so we have blood moving from the um, oxygenated supply on the left side of the heart over to the deoxygenated side. All that venous blood returning to the right atrium, right ventricle, getting pumped to the lungs. So uh, what do we see with left to right shunts? Uh, not cyanotic early in life. Does this make sense? So why, why is it not cyanotic? Mm-hmm. Very good. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, because you have oxygenated blood moving into deoxygenated, well, that's fine. It's just going to get a little bit more oxygen when it get, goes back to the lungs and gets pumped all the way around. Okay. It's not fine. You know, this is still a problem, but initially we're not going to see, you know, signs of cyanosis. However, uh, this can happen down the line. So uh, what m might we see? Dipsy on exertion. This makes sense. You know, as we start to exert ourselves, the heart, our body demands more oxygen, but our heart is having to pump both into the aorta and onto the right side of the heart. And so a lot of that blood is not getting where it's supposed to go. Uh, murmurs, of course, arrhythmias at any kind, anytime you have cardiac remodeling for any reason, you can develop arrhythmia, right? Thinking about any kind of hypertrophy in the heart, there are nerves, there are conduction highways traveling through those muscles, okay? And so any kind of cardiac remodeling can lead to an arrhythmia, and that is absolutely the case here. Uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, why, why, why is it right ventricular hypertrophy, not left? Yeah. Yeah, great. More blood on the right side means the right has to work harder. The left ventricle is is not having to pump against any any um, higher pressures. Okay, we only see left ventricular when it's pumping against the higher pressure, pumping through a stenosed valve, uh, having to pump extra blood. These these are the sort of situations, right, where you would see left ventricular. But uh, here we're seeing right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, which is going to ultimately lead to our problem of shunt reversal, and dizziness and fatigue. Okay, uh, a good rule of thumb. If it has a three letter abbreviation, ASD, VSD, PDA, think of a left to right shunt. Okay, so let's move into our ASD here. Uh, and so looking at this nice cartoon cutout of the heart, we can see that um, here's our right heart and our left heart. Uh, there are two possible ASDs that can develop. You can either have a primum type ASD or a secundum type ASD. Okay, so primum and secundum kind of sounds like first and second. And if you if we go back to embryology, what we learn is that uh, in the development of this septum, what happens is we have a, a little um, nest, you could say, of neural crest cells. Neural crest cells are those really cool stem cells that can develop into all sorts of things. They turn into your facial bones, the bones of your inner ear, some of your retina. There's so many things that neural crest cells can, can create. And in the heart, neural crest cells actually grow to form both the uh, intraventricular septum and the atrial septum here. Okay, and so uh, the endocardial cushion is what it's called. Endocardial cushion grows superiorly uh, and uh, forms 
essentially a wall between the right and left atrium. And at the same time, we have a little bit of growth of tissue from above. Now, as this tissue is growing, it's going to leave a small uh, opening during embryonic development. And this is really, really important. Okay, and the reason that this is important is because remember, when the fetus is growing, oxygenated blood travels in the venous supply. Oxygenated blood travels in the venous supply. So we have oxygenated blood coming from the placenta entering the right side of the heart. Okay, that oxygenated blood is going to pass into the left atrium, into the left ventricle to be pumped to the rest of the body. Okay, and so this is physiological, this is normal. As that baby takes its first breath of air after it's born, uh, a small flap is going to close over this, um, over this uh, ovale and, uh, and close it. Okay, and so that would ultimately make sure that there's no uh, conduction between the two chambers. The ostium ovale would be closed. Now, when we start thinking about septal defects, well, there's two ways for those septal defects to happen. Number one, uh, you know, thinking about this process from the beginning, we could have a problem in our endocardial cushion. Okay, and so say we have an issue with these neural crest cells. Say they don't grow vertically like they're supposed to. What's going to happen? Well, that's how we're going to get primum type ASD. This primum type ASD is going to allow blood to flow from the right atrium into the left uh, atrium after birth. Okay, and so this is really an issue with neural crest cells. When we think about uh, patients that have disorders with their neural crest cells, we are going to automatically think of Down syndrome. Okay, thinking about the clinical picture of a patient with Down syndrome. Okay, so Down syndrome patients have a typical kind of uh, facial features. Down syndrome patients have difficulty with the nervous tissue growth in their gut leading to Hirschsprung's disease, okay? Those ganglion cells don't make it all the way down to the distal colon, leading to Hirschsprung's disease, okay? And so, what do those have in common? Well, you need neural crest cells for those things. You need neural crest cells to develop your facial bones in the uh, quote-unquote typical way. You need neural crest cells to have those ganglion cells in your gut. You need neural crest cells for uh, many different things in your body. And patients with Down syndrome have uh, their neural crest cells don't sort of behave like the neural crest cells of people that don't have Down syndrome. And so that's sort of what leads to that pathology. And bringing it back to cardiac, we see that uh, those neural crest cells do not migrate in the way they're supposed to, leading to a septal defect. Okay. And so that's uh, associated mainly with Down syndrome. Now there's also, as we move forward through this whole process, this uh, second type of uh, septal defect. This is the most common type. And this is when the foramen ovale does not close, like we mentioned before. It's supposed to close when that baby takes its first big breath of air. The pressures change in the pulmonary supply. That, that leads to pressure change in the cardiac supply. And that leads to closing of the foramen ovale. If that foramen ovale does not close sufficiently, maybe the flap is open just a little bit, we can have a bit of a uh, septal defect there. Okay. And so uh, here's, you know, sort of our normal heart and circulation, obviously. And then with our uh, septal defect, we have extra blood getting into the right ventricle, as you told me before, leads to um, a uh, uh, hypertrophy in that area. Okay. So uh, complications here, paradoxical emboli. Okay. That sounds uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, help me out with what is a paradoxical emboli? Mm-hmm. Good. Yes, excellent. So uh, a, a embolus, say a DVT, right? Giving an example, say we have a DVT in someone's foot. That is a foot. I promise you that's a foot. We have a DVT here, travels up into the right heart. And um, as it's hanging out here in the atrium, waiting to enter the ventricle, it sees a little opening here and says, hey, let me hop over into the left heart. And it gets pumped in through into the arterial supply, and we end up with a patient having a stroke from a DVT that is not normal. And so the way that we diagnose this, and you may see this on your exam, is something called a bubble study. A bubble study is when you do an echocardiogram, which is really just an ultrasound of the heart. You know, when you're pregnant, you they do an ultrasound to look at the baby, 
when you have heart problems, they do an ultrasound and look at the heart. And that's what an echocardiogram is. And so the echocardiogram, um, they put the ultrasound, they look at the heart, and then they inject some bubbles into the venous supply. And you can actually watch those bubbles on the ultrasound. If you see bubbles going from the right atrium to the left atrium, that's a pretty um, gold standard diagnostic sign that you have a opening here. Otherwise, it can be tough to tell. Okay, great. And then Eisenmenger syndrome, this is the, um, you know, we love, you know, putting people's names on things in medicine. And so uh, essentially what Eisenmenger syndrome is, is when you have a shunt reversal. Why isn't it just called shunt reversal syndrome? Okay. We're not going to ask that question, but um, Eisenmenger syndrome is when we have a shunt reversal. And so, um, like we talked about before, this right ventricle is going to get larger and larger and larger. It's going to be generating higher and higher pressures. And eventually, instead of blood crossing from the left atrium to the right atrium, it's going to reverse. And so at that point, your uh, disease that is not cyanotic becomes cyanotic. Okay. And so Eisenmenger syndrome can be seen in any of these, um, of these septal defects we're going to talk about today, whether it's atrial, ventricular, whatever. Anytime you have a shunt reversal, that's Eisenmenger syndrome. Okay. Uh, so heart sounds, um, and we will talk about these specifically on their own but uh, when we do physiology. But some of the things you can look for, fixed S2 split, that is uh, money. That's money, okay? That is money for your AST. Uh, Mid-systolic murmur in the pulmonic post, mid-diastolic and tricuspid. These are a little bit harder to differentiate between the different uh, septal defects and, and uh, valve issues, but the fixed S2 split, that's, that's, that's money. If you see that, then you should definitely be thinking about your AST. For our ventricular septal defects, uh, here again, we can look at the cartoon and see we have blood coming from the body, blood traveling from the uh, atrium into the ventricle, and then uh, blood that is supposed to be uh, being pumped to the lungs may pump from the uh, right ventricle to the left in the case of a shunt reversal, uh, but typically early, it's going to be, of course, uh, not a cyanotic phenomenon. Okay, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, it is associated with this. Uh, you can see muscular type, this is 20%, and here in the cartoon you can see all of these uh, Swiss cheese appearance of the inter interventricular septum. And then there's also membranous type, and here I want to, again, think about that endocardial cushion and the endocardial cushion defect. The endocardial cushion, it grows vertically to form the ASD, excuse, ASD, to form the intraatrial septum, and then it grows... Um, you know, downwards, caudally, I guess, to form the uh, interventricular septum, okay? Again, you do have tissue growing from below to try and meet up with it. And so if you have an issue with these cells, these neural crest cells, tissue from below will grow in this interventricular septum, but no tissue grows downwards. And so you end up having a small gap nearby the endocardial cushion, okay? And so here you can see this, um, you know, uh, membranous type uh, VSD, which is close to that uh, endocardial cushion. Okay. Uh, so complications, of course, Eisenmenger syndrome, heart sounds, hollow systolic murmur, louder in tricuspid than in mitral. Okay, hollow systolic murmur, all through systole. Okay. Uh, and our last type of left to right shunt is our PDA, uh, patent ductus arteri arteriosis. And so, again, going back to embryology, we need to have these physiologic shunts to ensure that, um, that oxygenated blood is getting to the parts of the growing baby. And so, as we mentioned before, going back to embryology, when we think about a fetus, the oxygenated blood is coming up through the umbilical vein, right? Oxygenated blood traveling in a vein. That's what happens in babies. Uh, well, fetuses anyway. And so that oxygenated blood is going to cross over from the right atrium into the left atrium. It's going to go down into the ventricle, going to be pumped up into the aorta. Okay, and then it's going to go to the body. Now, what if some of that blood escapes down into the right ventricle? Is this the end of the world? The lungs, there's nothing going on in the lungs, right? There is no air there. There's no point to pump uh, for blood to go into the right ventricle. 
because if you pump blood to the lungs in a fetus, nothing's going to happen. There's no oxygen. Uh, well, you know, there's sort of this physiologic compensation for that. So if blood does get into the right ventricle, that blood is going to be pumped into the pulmonary trunk here and then cross right over into the aorta to join the other oxygenated blood. Okay, and so this sort of ensures that all of that oxygenated blood is getting where it's supposed to go, which is the aorta. Okay, now uh, that is the purpose of this particular physiologic shunt, which is the ductus arteriosus. And this ductus arteriosus is supposed to close within the first week of life. If it does not close, um, this is what's called a PDA. This is associated with congenital rubella. Um, and so that's sort of an important association there. You know, they do on the step one exam like to give you, describe a patient for you, describe a series of findings, you know, uh, blindness, deafness, and say uh, which of the congenital uh, infectious diseases caused this, um, you know, particular patient presentation. Um, you know, which of the torch infections uh, are these set of clinical findings associated with? Okay, and so for, if you do see PDA, I want you to go straight for that uh, rubella option choice uh, if answering that type of question. Now, uh, complications here, Eisenmenger syndrome, where we see lower extremity cyanosis. Okay, so that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different. In the other types of Eisenmenger syndrome, we just said that it's a shunt reversal and you start seeing cyanosis everywhere. But here, we're saying it's only on lower extremities. Help me understand that. Why is it just lower extremity cyanosis? Yes, excellent, great. Yeah, so here we see that you know you have the uh, the brachiocephalic, the carotid, uh, the subclavian uh, branches here, and then we have our uh, the the PDA. It's I mean this is a cartoon, right? But it does seem distal, and so ultimately, as you start to see that shunt reversal, uh, it's going to affect primarily the toes, right? You're going to get some blue toes. And so um, that's the reason for that. Uh, and that, that is something that if you see it on, when they describe that in a question stem, that the upper extremities look normal, but the lower extremities uh, sort of have a bluish tinge, oh my goodness, please be thinking PDA because you know the anatomy behind this particular pathology. Okay, now getting away from PDA for a second, let's say instead that they tell you that the patient has higher blood pressure in the upper extremities, but low blood pressure in the lower extremities, what pathology or disease should you be thinking of? What could cause a patient to have high blood pressure in the upper extremities, but low blood pressure in the lower extremities? Coarctation of the aorta, beautiful. Yes, so with a coarctation, we have that um, high, higher pressure building up behind the coarctation, and then distal to the coarctation, we have a lower blood pressure. Good, okay, so coarctation, you know, we're thinking about patients, Turner syndrome, things like that. So that's what we want to keep in mind. Excellent, very, very good. Uh, so intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, something to keep in mind as well for this particular disorder. Uh, so presence of a newborn with cyanosis and PDA does not point you to a right to left shunt. Okay, keep in mind that this, you know, takes time to develop. There can be another reason uh, for that cyanosis. Uh, more likely, the newborn is premature, has underdeveloped lungs, which causes the cyanosis. Be careful with the presentation and other causes of symptoms, okay? Because it takes a while for that PDA to turn into a right-to-left shunt. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes some time for those pressures to change and for deoxygenated blood to start getting pumped into the oxygenated supply. Remember, this right ventricle hasn't really been pumping that much over the course of this person's life, right? They've uh, you know, been alive uh, technically for, for you know, uh, nine months or so, I guess. And, uh, you know, that I guess that's up for debate. I'm not going to get into that. But um, so this heart hasn't been pumping. The right heart hasn't been pumping that long. Left ventricle has been pumping to the rest of the body for all this time. And so the left ventricle is still much stronger in this case. And, uh, you know, for that reason, you won't see blood crossing from pulmonary into the aortic supply in a newborn because the pressure is much higher in the aorta than it is in the pulmonary supply. So blood will always go uh, oxygenated to deoxygenated. 
in a newborn. As time goes on, we talked about how that's going to change. Okay. Uh, wonderful. So heart sounds, machine like murmur. That's a slam dunk. I don't even need to tell you that. That is a slam dunk. If you hear machine gun, next question, please. Right. Uh, good. So Eisenmenger syndrome, we've sort of discussed this already. Not early in the child's life may never happen if you know I have a patient with a small defect. Um, we sort of have talked about the phenomenon, so I'm going to go over it quickly. But the amount of blood shunted to the right heart induces right ventricular hypertrophy. The right heart is pumping more blood the volume is higher if you go to the gym you start lifting weights once a week that's fine if you lift weights every day your muscles are going to be <clears throat> right you're going to be um, busting out of your shirts and so that is why you end up seeing right ventricular hypertrophy uh, pulmonary hypertension so as the right ventricle is is getting larger it's pumping more blood to the lungs and so the pressure in that pulmonary uh, supply is going to increase. The pulmonary arterial supply, the pressure is going to go up. There's more blood, there's more uh, pressure being built up. Uh, the right heart pressure eventually is going to be greater than left heart pressure, and that left to right shunt that we were used to is going to reverse. Why? Because now the pressure on the right side is higher than the left. This is what leads to our cyanosis. Okay. So, other symptoms of of Eisenmenger syndrome, polycythemia, digital clubbing. Uh, digital clubbing is where you start to see the, um, if this is our, if this is our thumb, you start to see the nail of the um, finger grow over the edge. Okay, so if you look at your finger, you can see, you know, from the nail bed, the nail comes out, maybe it has a little bit of an arc, but you know, by the end, it doesn't sort of uh, overcome uh, you know, achieve the end of your finger and start growing over it. That is what's referred to as digital clubbing. Now, um, I, I will spend literally 30 seconds saying this because I don't want to spend too much time, but the actual uh, pathophysiology behind digital clubbing is interesting. This is not due to hypoxia, okay? It is not due to hypoxia. In medical school, that is what they told me. That is wrong. It is not due to low amounts of oxygen. The real reason for digital clubbing is megakaryocytes. Right? Mind blown. What happens is, in a normal lifespan of a megakaryocyte, it gets created in the bone marrow. It travels through the venous supply and it ends up at the lungs. When it gets to the lungs, it gets stuck in the tiny capillaries of the alveoli and these big megakaryocytes start, start schluffing off platelets, right? So it's giving off platelets. It starts, when you give off platelets, that releases a bunch of cytokines, a platelet derived growth factor, things like that, right? And so all these platelets get released and eventually megakaryocytes get super, super small and, um, they, and they don't bother anybody. Okay, and that's for in healthy in a healthy person. Now, if you have a shunt, that megakaryocyte gets to skip that lungs step. So the megakaryocyte starts in the bone marrow, it travels through the venous supply, it skips the lungs, and the first time it sees a capillary is in the distal fingertips. What happens there? Well, it gets stuck. It starts giving off those platelets just like it did in the lungs. But when you give off platelet derived growth factor nearby a bone, that bone is going to start to grow. And so giving off all of these cytokines, all these factors cause growth of these bones, causes increased uh, stimulation of the nail bed. And ultimately you see a much larger fingernail growing over it, and then the bones themselves and the fingertips uh, get larger. Okay, so that was that's that that kind of blew my mind when I found that out. So I had to share that with you because I found that so interesting. Okay, wonderful. So moving on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Great question. So you also see clubbing and bronchiectasis. You also see clubbing and cystic fibrosis. What do those have in common? destruction of the alveoli and with destruction of the alveoli you have destruction of those small capillaries and so and that i'm so glad you asked this question because i think it also demonstrates what's happening here when you destroy those small capillaries you're still going to have some anastomosis between the arterial and venous supply so those megakaryocytes are again going to have the opportunity to skip the capillaries of the lungs and go straight into the fingertips okay copd you might see digital clubbing COPD. What happens to COPD? 
destruction of the capillaries in the lungs. Okay, and so it definitely ends up being sort of a common theme anytime you see that. Um, the real phenomenon is not due to low oxygen, it's due to the, um, the stimulatory action of megakaryocytes. Right to left shunts, uh, what can we say about them? Cyanotic in er early in life. This is, I mean, right, if you have blood going from the right to the left, that is absolutely going to be cyanotic. You're going to have deoxygenated blood and mixing with oxygenated. Uh, there's the five terrible T's, um, which help us remember the causes. Tetralogy of Fallot, transposed great vessels, truncus arteriosus, tricuspid atresia, total anomalous pulmonary vein. Now, obviously, some of these are more high yield than others. Uh, things like tetralogy of Fallot, you need to know it, you need to know its associations, and you better know what that tetralogy is. Uh, transposed great vessels, mm, less uh, high yield. It can happen, but you know, if it's a disease that is just so deadly and that we can't really do much about, you're not going to get too many questions about it, and that's sort of a rule of thumb, but uh, you still got to know it. So transposed great vessels, a little bit less high yield. Truncus, a little bit less. Tricuspid atresia, they will ask you about because uh, you know, thinking about the physiology, thinking about the changes in uh, pressures uh, around the heart and in the lungs, um, they can kind of get into some uh, nitty gritty with that. And so you might see questions on tricuspid atresia. Total anomalous pulmonary vein, um, not as high yield again as some of these others. But tetralogy is one I really want you to know backwards and forwards. And so we're going to talk about it much longer than the other ones. So a tetralogy of Fallot, very, very important to George syndrome. Um, you know, we've talked in the past about some of the other things you see in DeGeorge. You know, not having your parathyroids, not having the ability to um, mature T cells because you lose your thymus. Uh, DeGeorge syndrome has a number of important um, um, anomalies that you see. What's the mutation for DeGeorge? That sounds right. 22Q11, that sounds right. Uh, so what do we see in Tetralogy of Fallot? So there's four things in Tetralogy of Fallot, but before you know, we really, well, actually, yeah. So let's talk about the four things first. So first, subpulmonic stenosis. Sub, what does that mean? Well, in order to get blood to the lungs, it's got to go through the pulmonary artery. We know that. So uh, blood is going to enter the right atrium, enter the right ventricle, and then enter the pulmonary supply so it can go to the lungs you can get some oxygen and come back to the heart now if you have stenosis of this pulmonary artery um, if you have stenosis just below the entrance of the pulmonary um, artery uh, if you have you know any of these things um, the stenosis can be anywhere um, uh, it's going to become difficult to pump blood into the pulmonary system okay so that's number one number two overriding aorta what does that mean well the aortic um, uh, the aortic artery in the valve ultimately um, sort of shifts a little bit to the right, okay? And so it ends up really overriding. It ends up sort of being a boss there and, and really sort of, um, you know, gobbling up all the blood from both vessels, or excuse me, both ventricles. A membranous VSD. We said membranous VSDs. Those are VSDs that are closer to that endocardial cushion. And so that means it is a VSD that is up high, close to the entrance of the uh, pulmonary our, uh, artery and the aorta, uh, and a right ventricular hypertrophy, a boot-shaped heart. Okay, now, uh, these are four things. You can memorize them on on their, on your own, one by one by one, or you can remember one simple fact, and this is the fact um, that sort of determines everything about this disorder, okay? So I'm going to draw a very simplistic heart, okay? This is our heart. We're going to say that this is the, um, the, this is the say, SVC, Okay, that makes this the right atrium. Okay, here's our right ventricle. Here is our pulmonary artery. Okay, and so here is our uh, intraventricular septum. Here's the valve between the right atrium and right ventricle. Here's the in intra um, uh, atrial septum, left atrium, pulmonary vein, and the aorta. Okay, very, very simplistic diagram here, but um, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make one small change that is gonna explain everything about, uh, about this disorder, okay? And that small change I'm gonna make here in red is I'm gonna say that 
the intraventricular septum, instead of being in the current place that it is and being the size that it is, I'm gonna shift it over. I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller and I'm gonna shift it over a little bit, okay? Now, if we think about what that small change would do to our heart, we see a domino effect, okay? So if we made our septum smaller and a little bit to the right, well, that means that blood that is trying to leave the right ventricle and enter the pulmonary supply is gonna have less space to do so. Okay, now it, we have sort of a stenosis. It cannot get into that area. If, this is, if the septum itself is smaller, that means it's not covering that whole space. And so we're gonna end up with the ability of blood to travel in, over this septum. Okay, now if I move this over here to the right a little bit, that means the aorta is gonna be a little bit bigger. We're gonna have more space for the aorta to, uh, to uh, accept blood. And then last, if we have a right ventricle that is having to push against pressures from the left ventricle, the right ventricle is gonna get bigger. Okay, so you can see how one small change actually leads to the entire clinical picture of Tetralogy of Fallot. And to bring back a word that just keeps coming back again and again and again and again and again today, this is an endocardial cushion defect. Okay, the George syndrome thinking about the George syndrome. These patients have uh, pathology with their facial bones. They have pathology with, their, with some of their glands. They have pathology with some other things. And again, this ultimately ends up co coming back to the endocardial cushion. And so what we see here is that because the endocardial cushion is shifted over a little bit, it stenoses the pulmonary artery. We get a large um, aortic valve and aorta to accept blood from both ventricles and all the other pathology that we see. So uh, with these patients, um, as you know, they start to have more and more um, inability to pump blood to their lungs, they're going to start uh, doing these things called TET spells. Uh, sudden increase in cyanosis followed by syncope, the child will squat during TET spell. Now, what does a squatting do? Anytime you get these questions, they will give you different kinds of questions that involve increasing the peripheral arterial pressure, okay? There's, uh, there's squatting, there's the squeezing test where you grab onto something and squeeze it really, really tight with your arm. All that these tests are saying is what happens if we increase the peripheral arterial pressure? The peripheral arterial pressure, what happens? And so if we increase the pressure in the arterial supply, that is going to make it more difficult for the aorta to accept blood. Okay, the left ventricle is going to be pumping a certain pressure out, and uh, if there's a high pressure here, well, liquids always go towards the area of lowest pressure. So that blood, rather than going into the aorta, will go into the stenosed pulmonary artery. That means more blood getting to the lungs. That means more oxygenated blood coming back to the left heart to uh, ultimately get pumped to the body. Okay, and so these kids with Tetralogy of Fallot, they have this instinctual, or they, not maybe not instinctual, but they come to understand that anytime they squat down, they feel a little bit better. They get a little bit less dizzy. Okay, they get a little bit less out of breath. And the reason is they increase that peripheral pressure by squatting, and more blood goes to the lungs instead of going to the, um, to the periphery. Okay, questions on this one? No? Okay, great. Uh, so next are transposed great vessels here. The aorta is connected to the right ventricle. The uh, pulmonary artery is connected to the left ventricle. Uh, associated with maternal diabetes, um, this is high yield. If not for step one, definitely for step two. Um, make sure you know for each of these terrible T's what the association is, if there is one. So dextro transposition causes cyanosis from birth. Going back to our embryology, there's a spiraling that happens with the pulmonary artery and the aorta in order to you know, ensure that they're both connected to the correct um, ventricle. Um, and usually seen with other congenital heart defects in ASD, VSD, PDA, and that is required, right? Because if you don't have that, then you won't be able to get oxygenated blood to the body. And so um, it would not be compatible with life. Uh, so if they have a PDA, you want to keep it open. It remains patent with prostaglandins. Okay. Um, there's there's got to be a better way to remember that. <laughs> um, to keep it open, you need a prostaglandin open and 
prostaglandin both have a P. Um, if you want to go in and close it, then you give indomethacin, maybe. Not, not the best. I'm not coming up with the best uh, mnemonics today, but, um, but that is something that you definitely want to remember, that prostaglandins will keep open uh, the PDA, and any kind of NSAID would close it, because NSAIDs, of course, reduce the amount of prostaglandins. Um, what can we look up for on a chest x-ray? It has this egg on a string appearance. Uh, we're just sort of hanging in the uh, thoracic cavity. Okay, any questions here? Pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, next is our trunchus arteriosus here. The aorta and pulmonary arteries fail to separate. We get biventricular hypertrophy, and uh, there's a VST here as well. Loud S2, mid systolic murmur in the pulmonic post. Uh, I mean, trunchus arteriosus, to be able to diagnose this off of heart sounds would be a big ask, a big ask. And um, hopefully they wouldn't expect you to do that. But um, uh, of course, you would see a loud S2 because you've got a gigantic valve there. And so that's going to be pretty noisy. Uh, tricuspid atresia. Here, we do not have development of the tricuspid valve, which is, of course, between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And so we ultimately end up with a single ventricle that accepts blood from a single atrium uh, and delivers blood to two, um, to two vessels. Okay. And so we have to have an ASD and VSD in order to facilitate life. The heart size is going to be normal, and we really ultimately end up with a single ventricle. Holosystolic murmur here. Uh, last is total anomalous pulmonary veins. Here, uh, this can be very, very variable. And so you can have um, blood, you know, uh, sort of returning from the pulmonary vein and then joining the SVC. You can have blood... Uh, you know, joining the aorta, you can have blood really coming in uh, pulmonary vein, uh, connected to the left atrium, it can really be there's a lot of variability in terms of what this this particular disorder looks like. And so what can we say about what do they have in common? Well, you tend to see a figure eight sign or snowman sign on uh, chest x ray, uh, you'll see right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, um, some heave loud s one fixed split, S3 and a mid systolic murmur. Okay, and so that's it for our terrible T's. Um, moving on here to our coarctation of the aorta. Uh, as you told me eloquently before, there is hypertension in the upper extremities, hypotension, absent pulses in the lower extremities. And the reason is because uh, pressure is getting increased here in the proximal aorta and then lower in the distal. Okay, uh, infantile coarctation. This is our sporadic type, um, without much of an association. Uh, it is sporadic, and this tends to be before the ductus arteriosus. And so here you can see we're describing. Uh, here is our pulmonary artery. Okay, pulmonary artery branching into the left, and into the uh, well. That would be the left. That would be the right. And then uh, we see our aorta here. Okay, and here is our ductus arteriosus. Okay, and so you can have a preductal coarctation where the coarctation happens before the ductus arteriosus, and then you can have your uh, your this is associated with Turner syndrome, and then our postductal we tend to see in adults, uh, and this is associated with rib notching, and the reason is because blood is trying to reach um, the, uh, the sort of the distal supply, trying to reach the gut, trying to reach the legs. And so it utilizes the, uh, the subcostal arteries under each rib to reach the internal mammary artery, travel down and anastomose with the uh, sort of the inguinal artery system there uh, and uh, ultimately be able to deliver blood to the legs. Okay, And so because you know, these patients live with it for such a long time, uh, you end up seeing rib notching just due to that high volume of blood going through the subcostal arteries, which are typically not accustomed to handling lots of blood. Okay, great. So a mid-systolic murmur, decrescendo diastolic murmur in the aortic post. Okay, now a decrescendo diastolic murmur, I really wanna be careful with that and I would even take this off because I want you to have a really strong association 
of decrescendo diastolic murmur with aortic regurgitation. When you see the words early, decrescendo, diastolic murmur, I want you to think of aortic regurgitation and nothing else. In aortic regurgitation, you end up having sort of that incompetent aortic valve that allows blood to travel backwards into the left ventricle from the aorta during diastole. Okay, and when they say early um, diastolic murmur, early decrescendo especially, I want you to just be thinking, oh my God, that is aortic regurg and nothing else. I want you to you know, have that strong association, keep it forever. Um, and so I would really prefer you not make that association with coarctation. Instead, make it with uh, aortic regurg. Okay, so pretend you didn't read that. Okay, really, really old memes here. Uh, so acute rheumatic fever. Um, sore throat can lead to a broken heart. That is beautiful. So what do we have here? So a systemic manifestation approximately two weeks after group A strep pharyngitis. After group A strep pharyngitis. Now, that means that it is not the bacteria itself that is causing acute rheumatic fever. I know that you know this. I know this is a review for you. But um, just to reinforce that, this is not due to the bacteria itself infecting your heart valves. Okay, what, what we instead see are these sterile vegetations on the valves. Sterile meaning there's no bacteria found in them. What's happening is that our body has reacted to that group A strep. In trying to fight it, it's reacting to a number of the group A strep proteins. Uh, any kind of bacteria has a million proteins associated with it. And our body is going to look at those proteins and try and attack each one that, that we can mount a response against. One of those proteins on the group A strep bacteria looks like a protein that is on our own valves. Okay, This is M protein molecular mimicry. And uh, but in reacting to this bacteria, we end up reacting to our own valves. And so even though the bacteria is gone at this point, we end up seeing um, some serious, serious symptoms. And so uh, what can we see? Valvulitis. Okay. And uh, this tends to affect the mitral valve. Pericarditis, um, you know, myocarditis. I really want you to remember the, va uh, the, um, you know, the valve being affected because that's what comes up the most. Erythema marginatum, subcutaneous nodules, a pain in the joints, Ashoff nodule. If you do a biopsy of the heart, um, this is what you see. Rather than seeing nice organized um, cardiomyocytes, what instead is you see some disorganized type um, cells inside of the myometrium. Uh, myometrium is in the uterus. I mean the, um, the cardio uh, muscle, cardiac muscle. Um, you end up seeing some very disorganized cells. And so uh, this is, you know, it's called an Ashoff nodule and just happens to be something you see in acute rheumatic fever. Um, let's see, what else can we say here? Sinehams chorea is something else that you can see as the blood-brain barrier becomes um, incompetent. Other things you can see on, um, on pathology is these things called Anichkow cells uh, inside, again, of the um, cardiomyocytes. The criteria for acute rheumatic fever um, joints is the J. Um, o is, is really a heart. You have to draw it like a heart, which is the, uh, how the heart is affected in this disorder. Nodules, erythema marginatum, and syndium. Korea. Okay. And so I really want you to remember, uh, you know, that this really tends to affect the mitral valve and all of this can be prevented with penicillin. Okay. And so really your, as long as you treat your patient, um, you know, um, in a timely fashion, uh, treat that group A strep in a timely fashion, your patient will not go on to develop these symptoms. Okay. Now let's say that you don't treat your patient. Or what's even more likely is your patient lives in a under-resourced area and in a, they don't have access to health care. Um, you know, in the U.S., you know, it really can be difficult to get in to see a physician um, unless you uh, have a certain background or you're from a certain um, class. Um, another scenario is, you know, your patient comes from an area of the world where it's very, very difficult, where they have to travel long distances to see a doctor. And so what felt like a sore throat, uh, they felt sick for two, three, four weeks and then got better, 
um, was that you know acute rheumatic fever that they were feeling okay so they grow up and then you know when they hit 45 50 60 they start having trouble going upstairs they start getting shortness of breath and you know when you listen to their heart what you hear is a uh, systolic excuse me a diastolic murmur okay you hear this whooshing diastolic murmur what you're hearing is stenosis of the mitral valve due to chronic rheumatic heart disease Okay, that patient that couldn't get in to see a physician for their group A strep pharyngitis has now grown up and has developed chronic rheumatic heart disease. So when you get in a question stem, information about um, a patient who immigrated to the U.S. or who hasn't seen a doctor since they were two weeks old and they have some sort of, uh, you know, cardiac type picture, thinking about chronic rheumatic heart disease. So here we have valvular scarring secondary to continuous repeated inflammation, eventually leading to stenosis. Uh, rheumatic heart disease is a resolved phase of acute rheumatic fever. Think about it that way. So mitral valve stenosis, thick chordae tendinae, thickened cusps. Again, here we're going to hear a diastolic murmur. When it is supposed to be open, it's making a lot of noise. Uh, you can also see some aortic valve insufficiency regurgitation with fusion of the commissures, which, you know, essentially the areas where the pieces of the valve come together become fused. These leaflets become fu uh, fused together. Um, one last thing I want to say about mitral valve stenosis, because this valve is stenosed, you have to think about the eight, anytime you have a stenosed valve, whatever, um, you know, whatever part of the heart is trying to pump through that valve is going to become dilated. Okay. Or is going to hypertrophy. And so if you have stenosis of the mitral valve, you should expect to see, uh, left atrial dilation left atrial dilation. Okay, left atrial dilation can lead to, um, you know, arrhythmias, it can lead to a lot of different problems. If you have stenosis of the aortic valve, you should expect to see uh, left ventricular hypertrophy trying to pump against that, uh, that narrowed area. Bacterial endocarditis, here we have a true infection of a heart valve. Okay, last was not really a true infection of the heart valve. This is our body doing the damage. Here we have a true bacterial infection of the heart valve. And so what does it look like? Uh, you know, a lot of times these patients, it's not particularly obvious. You kind of have to think about it. Uh, and so your patient can, if this is a chronic type bacterial endocarditis, they could have felt sick for months. It could have been six months. Man, I've just not been feeling well, been having low fevers, difficulty sleeping, night sweats. I mean, you know, if I hear that, my mind is think going straight to some sort of, you know, oncological pathology. I'm thinking some kind of cancer. I'm thinking, you know, uh, you know, hypothyroidism when I hear that particular patient presentation. So bacterial endocarditis is not at the top of my mind. You really gotta you know, sort of keep it on your differential when you have a patient um, who's been sick for a long time. This, this belongs on that differential because it can be chronic. And so what is the pathophysiology here? Essentially what we see is just these huge, um, maybe not huge, maybe small, maybe large, masses of bacteria, um, neutrophils, fibrin, complement, all these really inflammatory type factors on the valve itself. And this is so, so important because when we think about all of the clinical presentation, this is all gonna be secondary to the fact that the bacteria are located in an area where they can get into the blood supply. What do I mean by that? Well, if we think about, let's say this is our valve. We think about, this is our valve. Let's say this is the left ventricle. This is the aorta and we have a little bacterial colony here, this bacterial colony is gonna be facing a lot of pressures, right? This is like the stone that is under the brook, all right? You go out for a walk in the woods and you can see a nice little stream. There's stones in the water. Those stones are very, very smooth on top, right? And the reason is because they're constantly being impacted by the water above it. And so that's gonna happen here, that this, um, this represents a stone sort of in that analogy. So this bacterial colony is gonna be facing a lot of pressures of blood passing by it. And so it's not gonna grow terribly large, but what is gonna happen is little bits of bacteria are going to join in that supply and get into the aorta every single time the heart beats. 
right, from the impact of the valve opening and closing, from the high pressure of the blood passing by, bacteria is going to join into the stream and then enter the body. And so as bacteria is joining in the stream, it's going to be deposited, say, in the tiny capillaries under the fingernail. It's going to be deposited in the tiny capillaries at the ends of our fingertips, the tiny capillaries in our retina, which is the worst place that it can be deposited, right? Um, and so, you know, thinking about the clinical picture here, it's good to have that understanding that, okay, well, the reason that we don't see, you know, an abscess, for example, is because there's only little bits of bacteria that are joining in the blood supply. And our body is usually pretty good at dealing with little bits of bacteria. Uh, when you get inundated all over your body, it's kind of tough, but you know, we're not really seeing abscesses. We're not seeing huge growths of bacteria in any particular area because the original colony is constantly having to face these high pressures and the um, sort of em embolizing mini colonies are not large. And so we end up just seeing these sort of uh, superficial type issues. Okay, great. So, um, you know, what is the most common cause? Strep viridans is going to be overall the most common on the left. Uh, uh, for right sided, we have Staph aureus. Remember, with that left sided, um, excuse me, remember with the right sided, this tends to be IV drug users. This tends to be, um, you know, an inoculation, an infection of the tricuspid valve, because that's the first valve that these bacteria get um, encounter as they enter the venous supply. Okay, and so look for all of these superficial um, lesions. And uh, you can always listen, listen for that mid-diastolic murmur with the opening snap. On the left would be mitral, on the right would be tricuspid. And with that, we will conclude our first hour of discussion of cardiac pathology. And there is more to discuss, my friends. As you know, we still have mountains to climb together, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, acute coronary syndrome. What does that even mean? myocardial infarction. How does the location, anatomical location, of an occlusion of a coronary artery impact the potential complications? Our patient presentation, the EKG, we're going to discuss all these things. If you occlude the left anterior descending artery, how is that going to look different than occluding the left circumflex? We're going to answer that question, and uh, we're going to go through it together. And so, uh, please, again, uh, go ahead and like, share, subscribe, send me a little bit of love in the comments. I am so happy to have you here, and I can't wait to see you again. Until next time.